I've got to say, for the first time in a long time, politics is actually fun again. Like, I finally remember why I started doing a show talking about politics. People are engaged, they're memeing, and the vibes are great. And I'm really pleased to see that Kamala Harris's campaign is also having fun because them having fun tells me that they're confident, which is a really good sign. Now, if a campaign is not having fun and their presidential nominee is spending all day molding on social media while his aides beg him to stop talking about his opponent's race, that's how you know they're not feeling too good. But I know that Kamala's team is having a good time right now because of the things that they're doing. One of them is is the posts that they're making on Truth Social. Yes, you heard that right. They're making posts on Truth Social. Kamala HQ has almost 300,000 followers there, and uh, they're going out of their way to shit post and troll Donald Trump on his own platform. So they've repeatedly compared her crowd sizes to his crowd sizes, which is something that you know is getting under his skin since he talks about crowd sizes all the time and is pretty self-conscious about them. They're also taunting Donald Trump for having low energy since he's not doing a lot of campaign events and is instead sending out J.D. Vance to campaign for them, which is not a good choice. They're trolling him for refusing to debate her and making fun of him for trying to move the debate to Fox News instead. They're sharing memes about how J.D. Vance exploited working people and LARPed as a working class person to get rich. And in general, this account is a goldmine. But to be fair, the Biden campaign actually created this account back in October of last year, and they were pretty active to their credit, but they mostly just shared clips of anti-Trump Republicans criticizing Donald Trump or Republicans like Lauren Boebert calling the GOP leadership ineffective. So they were just trying to appeal to Trump's base on his own platform and get them to not support him or maybe drive down support among his following. Now, I have no idea if it's the same people running that account, but as of late, they're actually having a lot of fun. They're shitposting, they're taunting Donald Trump on his own platform, and you love to see it. You want to see a candidate have fun, and they are clearly having fun. Now, contrast that with Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, and it's evident that they're not having a good time. Every smile from J.D. Vance looks either forced or downright painful for him, and his misery is so evident that a reporter literally asked him why he's such a miserable son of a bitch. Not their words, my words, but nonetheless, let's watch. You've been criticized as being a little too serious, maybe angry sometimes. What makes you smile? What makes you happy? Well, I, I smile at a lot of things, including bogus questions from the media, man. <laughs> I mean, look, I think if you watch if you watch a full speech that I give, I actually uh, I'm having a good time out here and I'm enjoying this. But look, uh, sometimes you got to take the good with the bad. And right now I am angry. Sure you are. Listen, in a campaign with a woman on one side and two men on the other side, I never in a million years would have expected that the men would be attacking the woman for being too joyful and laughing while reporters are telling the men, hey, listen, toots, smile a little bit, lighten up, you're coming off as bitchy. I mean, what world are we living in? How have the tables turned this much? It's, it's genuinely hilarious, but I'm here for it. I love this timeline. Now, part of the reason why Kamala's people is having a good time is because it's easy to have a good time when you're optimistic, when the momentum is on your side, and the momentum is very clearly on Kamala Harris's side. In fact, Harris just overtook Trump in national polling averages, which means that Trump is losing for the first time this entire year. Now, it's within the margin of error, so keep that in mind, but the trend here is encouraging. And even Rasmussen, which notoriously skews Republican, only has Trump at plus one when he was up plus seven just a couple of weeks ago. Now, on 538, she's also ahead based on aggregate polling data by nearly two points, so a little bit more. And the reason why her average there is a bit higher is in part due to them not including junk polls in their averages. Now, the obvious caveat is that polling is just a snapshot in time and things can change. And you really can get the best sense as to where the race is at by looking at polling averages. That being said, you can get some really important insight from specific polls. And I do want to look at one poll by Marist, PBS, and NPR because they explained why things are trending in Kamala's direction based on the results 
uh, from their poll. So NPR reports Harris's biggest boost is coming with black voters. She has gone from a 23 point lead with black voters over Trump a couple of weeks ago when many voters moved into the undecided camp to a 54 point lead. Now, Harris is moving closer to territory where Democrats need to be with black voters. Harris is also now winning independence, something Biden was not doing. Harris is up nine points with independence, 53 to 44 percent. She was down 14 points with them last month. And in early July, Trump was beating Biden by four points with the group. Harris has also improved with white voters overall. Harris has gone from 40 percent with white voters overall to 46 percent in this survey, which is closer to where Biden was. And that's very high for a Democrat. In fact, no Democrat has scored that high with white voters in a presidential election since Jimmy Carter in 1976. Biden got 41 percent in 2020. Barack Obama in 2008 won 43 percent. She's also winning with old Older voters. Harris is leading Trump by 11 points with baby boomers, 55% to 54%, for example. Latinos have also moved in Harris's favor. 58% say they would vote for her now compared to 51% last month. That's still below the 65% Biden won in 2020. In other words, Harris is winning back key constituencies that the Democratic Party needs that Biden was starting to lose. Now, there's still a gender gap, and she's not where she needs to be when it comes to millennials and Zoomers, and it's kind of difficult to get where they're at because they're historically not very reliable when it comes to voting. So you don't necessarily know how many of them will turn out, and that's going to be a big factor in the general. But a good sign is that younger voters, along with black and Latino voters, are all saying that they're more enthused now about Harris than they were about Biden. So she's not exactly where she needs to be just yet. But if current trends are any indication, she will eventually be where she needs to be. Now, this poll was conducted before she named Tim Walls as her VP. And, you know, if the momentum and the energy that we're seeing around that is any indication, odds are she could get a bump from that as well. So we don't know yet. We'll have to wait and see. But just keep that in mind. So, you know, it's really easy to have fun and live a little when your base isn't horrified at the prospect of losing this election. And it's why we've seen a pretty big vibe shift where earlier in this year, conservatives were the ones who were giddy and feeling good. And now they're the ones who are mauling and shitting themselves. But to be fair, Trump hasn't really had fun since 2016. And in this election, he's been more insufferable than ever before. And he's still talking about how the 2020 election was stolen from him. And I still cannot get over the fact that he literally is publishing fan fiction on Truth Social about Biden making a comeback at the DNC. That is the most pathetic shit I've ever seen and not a good sign. So he's big mad. But here's the thing. As mad as he is, Kamala Harris is still very much the underdog in this election, and there's still more than enough time for him to turn this around in his favor if he wanted to. The problem is that he still hasn't come up with a single coherent message or line of attack to use against Kamala Harris. He's not even campaigning. He's sending out J.D. Vance to do rallies for him. And that's something who you should be hiding right now because he's the least charismatic person ever who's hemorrhaging support. Now, he's just like, I guess, locked up in his basement, tweeting on Truth Social, cooking up new names for Kamala. That's that's what he's doing. That's how he thinks he's going to turn this around. It's just so weird. It, it tells me that he's lost his mojo and I don't think he can get it back because he lost his mojo in 2020. That was clear. But in 2024, he's a completely different person. He's a shell of his former self. And, you know, the hilarity that ensued on the 2016 campaign, the way that he was able to appeal to working class people with a populist message, it was a fake populist message, but still populist nonetheless, that's just gone now. It's just all grievance politics. He's complaining. He's whining. He said that the election was stolen from him. He thinks he's been treated unfairly. It's not about you. It's about us, right? And that's what he doesn't get. But, you know, I guess you could say he's trying. And by trying, uh, I mean, he cooked up a new name for Kamala Harris. You know, he started with laughing Kamala. Then he went to uh, crazy Kamala. There's been others there as well. And now he's been using Kamabla. And nobody really knows what that means. It's by far and away the worst name he's ever come up with for, uh, for his opponent. And I feel like maybe this is a typo that he's just running with. We all don't know. And I just... <laughs> I genuinely don't think his team knows. And I say this because HuffPost's White House correspondent reached out to Trump's team to ask him, hey, what exactly does this mean? 
And this is the response that they got. Hey, why is he misspelling her name? Kamabla. What does that mean? Kamabla. Can I use on the record? Kamabla. Okay. So his own team doesn't know. And the way that they're replying, it's hard to not imagine them sitting in a corner, rocking back and forth, deliriously saying, Kamabla, Kamabla, Kamabla over and over again because they're like coping and that's how they, they deal with the new polls that they're seeing. I don't know. I genuinely don't know what it means. Uh, CNN's Caitlin Collins doesn't know what it means. And she asked Trump surrogate Doug Burgum what it means. And his response was basically, I don't know. At least five times since Monday. And this is something I'm personally curious about. Donald Trump has been referring to Harris on social media as Kamabala, I guess is how you pronounce it. It's five posts uh, on Monday. Do you know where that came from and, and what that nickname means? I, I, I can't uh, comment on that, but I, I do know that uh, when voters are making a decision, uh, they're going to end up voting in many ways their pocketbook. And Two hours later. On the economy, on the border, and on, yeah. on the wars overseas, that it, it's a losing bet. They've, they've been dealt a losing hand. It doesn't matter how interesting their bios are, uh, it's a losing hand for them on the issues that matter the most. Okay, but you don't know where the nickname came from either because it is a mystery to, to us. <laughs> Yeah. So when you're on campaign and campaign surrogates don't even know what the fuck you're talking about. Listen, if you want to win, you've got to reassess and you've got to recalibrate. But instead of trying to, I don't know, find some kind of attack that lands, what is he doing? He's doubling down on conspiracies about Kamala Harris's race to the chagrin of literally every other Republican in the country who desperately wants him to shut the fuck up so he doesn't lose. Now, on Fox News, you know, he resorted to whining more about how well-liked Kamala is because, you know, I guess the whining is his go-to strategy. The media is is so... Uh, they're trying to build her up to the next uh, Margaret Thatcher liberal version, and I don't believe it's going to happen. Uh, I hear she's uh, hasn't taken one interview. She would never do an interview like this. That, that I can get with any network. She doesn't do interviews because she can't answer questions. I don't know how she debates. I heard she's sort of a nasty person, but not a good right. uh, good debater. But we'll see because we'll be de debating her, I guess, in the pretty near future. It's going to be announced fairly soon, but we'll be debating her. I'd like to well, see it on Fox, by the way. I would like to see it. My preference would be Fox, but we have to debate. Do, do you have, have an announcement, debate. Mr. Bur Look. He's shown all of his cards at this point, and Trump has always been a really easy person to read, but you can just hear in his voice how unnerved he is with the reality that he now has to run against Kamala Harris and not Joe Biden. He longs for the days when he was running against sleepy Joe Biden because that was just easier. He doesn't like that he's playing on a higher difficulty mode because... It's really hard. And he still hasn't come up with an effective line of attack against her, still doesn't want to debate her unless it's in a safe space with a network that's more favorable to him, which is embarrassing. And it really feels like he's too frustrated and he's just throwing his hands up and saying, I give up. Now, he can't quit because he's the nominee. He has no choice. But, you know, if things continue in this direction, the whining is only going to get worse. And I know that we've all kind of gotten used to Donald Trump whining after nearly 10 years of him in American politics. But buckle up, because he's going to get a lot more insufferable if he doesn't find a solution to his problem here. Now, I do want to go back to politics being fun because it doesn't only have to be fun when you're winning. That's the point. Sometimes it's actually fun when you're the underdog. Trump was the underdog back in 2016, and he won, and he had a great time doing it. That was apparent. But his supporters, you know, they helped with that. They memed, they shitposted, and you could tell that they were genuinely enthusiastic. And that wasn't why he was elected, but it mattered because that enthusiasm drew people in. And now enthusiasm around Kamala is drawing people in. But there's no sign of life when it comes to Donald Trump. And if there's no sign of life at the top of the ticket— and they feel like they're going to lose, and it's nonstop whining and grievance politics, it's hard for supporters to foster organic momentum for the candidate that they're supporting, which is why it's so important that candidates have fun. Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz are very clearly having a good time. The energy that they are radiating is evident. 
And Tim Walz said that Kamala Harris is bringing joy back to politics. And I think he's right about that. It's having an effect. And it's not something that policy wonks like myself typically think about. But we can't deny the power of memes and good vibes. It matters in elections. Her campaign has cl clearly embraced all of that. And it's one of the many reasons why I think that she's running the best presidential campaign since Obama in 2008. So listen, I don't want to speak too soon. Trump could find his footing and stop flailing and come up with the line of attack that actually does, you know, resonate with voters. But as we speak right now, he's not doing that. He's suffering. And as he suffers, he's getting more insufferable. And Kamala, she's having a great time. And uh, it's so nice to see a vibe shift this drastic, considering we were, we were all like really upset just a month ago. But things have changed. And right now, I'm going to embrace it. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? 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 <laughs> tree? They not like us. Tree? Tree? You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? 